Hello everybody, Ben here. Welcome to our midweek Advent Reflections. This is our third week of Advent and Christmas is just on the horizon. In fact, it's so close to the horizon that today is Gregory's last day of nursery, tomorrow is Ted's last day of school, and so from their perspective, the theme for this week couldn't be more fitting. This is the week we look at the meaning of joy. And I tell you, their hearts are going to burst with joy at the news that they now have this run of days at home to enjoy Christmas. I don't know about you, but one of my favorite Christmas carols of all time is Joy to the World. And as I started thinking about that, uh, that carol, thinking about what I wanted to share today, I did a bit of research, a bit of digging, and I was quite surprised to discover that when its author, Isaac Watts, first put pen to paper in 1719, he never ever intended Joy to the World to become a Christmas carol. In fact, the text Joy to the World was originally titled The Messiah's Coming and Kingdom, and it was located in Watts' Psalms of David Imitated, this volume that he put together of his own take on, uh, on the Psalms. And it was his interpretation of Psalm 98, one of the lines of that psalm reads, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. You know, Watts connected the joy found in the psalm to the worship and praise of the coming Messiah, God's anointed one. And he interpreted this psalm as a celebration of Jesus' role as the king of all the world. Now, as a poem celebrating the second and final coming of Jesus, you could say that Joy to the World is an ideal Advent carol rather than a Christmas carol. Uh, in fact, it's a permanent association with Christmas. wouldn't come in, into its own until a century and a half later in 1836 when a Jersey-born uh, man named Lowell Mason put his musical arrangement to the hymn. Da, 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 and so forth, giving voice to the carol that we now know and love to this day. Um, but you know what, whilst it wasn't intended as a Christmas carol, I think Joy to the World cuts right to the heart of the great Christmas proclamation. In Luke's Gospel, it begins with John the Baptist. The angel speaks to Zechariah and he says, he, meaning John, little John, will be a joy, a joy and a delight to you. And many will rejoice because of John's birth. When Elizabeth, heavily pregnant with John, receives a visit from her younger cousin, Mary, she reports that as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. And of course, at John's birth, the theme sounds yet again. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, we read, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her a great mercy and they shared her joy. And all of these announcements of joy in the Gospel of Luke foreshadow what was yet to come. For John repeatedly said himself that he is but the forerunner. One is coming who is greater than he. So if the arrival of John is something that provokes comfort and joy in the hearts of people, how much more so will the arrival of the one, the very Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? And so on that cold starry night, we hear the angelic proclamation resound across the hill country of Bethlehem. Do not be afraid, for I bring you news that will cause great joy for all the people for today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. News that will cause great joy for all people. Joy to the world, the Lord is come.
So this theme of joy runs right through the nativity story, deep through the good news of the gospel, deep through the great hymns and the carols of both Advent and Christmas, marking Jesus' arrival and the arrival yet to come. And yet we find ourselves today still wrestling with this basic question, what does the word actually mean, right? What is a biblical understanding of joy? How can we possibly be a people of joy in such dark and frightening times as we find ourselves right now? Well, as we've been doing throughout this little midweek reflection series, I want us to listen in to the Bible Project and see if there are any insights from looking at the biblical landscape uh, for us to understand what this word joy means and how it can shape our stories. So let's watch in. Being in a good mood is really great, and most languages have lots of words to describe the experience, like happy, cheerful, joyful, and so on. The same goes for the languages of the Bible. In ancient biblical Hebrew, there's a variety of words, like simcha, sason, or gil. In the Greek New Testament, there's kara, euphersune, or agaliasis. Each word has its own unique nuance, but they all basically refer to the feeling of joy and happiness. Now what makes these biblical joy words interesting is noticing the kinds of things that bring happiness and also seeing how joy is a key theme that runs through the whole story of the Bible. Let's start with sources of joy. On page one of the Bible, God says that this world is very good. And so naturally, people find joy in beautiful and good things of life, like growing flocks or an abundant harvest on the hills. The poet of Psalm 104 says a good bottle of wine is God's gift to bring joy to people's hearts. People find joy at a wedding or in their children. There's even a Hebrew proverb that compares the joy that perfume brings to your nose with the joy a good friend brings to your heart. However, human history isn't just a joy fest. The biblical story shows how we live in a world that's been corrupted by our own selfishness. It's marked by death and loss. And this is where biblical faith offers a unique perspective on joy. It's an attitude God's people adopt, not because of happy circumstances, but because of their hope in God's love and promise. So when the Israelites were suffering from slavery in Egypt, God raised up Moses to lead them into freedom. And the first thing the Israelites did was sing for joy. Even though they were in the middle of a desert, they were vulnerable, the promised land was still far away, they rejoiced anyway. Later biblical poets looked back on this story and they remembered how the Lord caused his people to leave with joy, his chosen ones with shouts of joy. 
This joy in the wilderness, this was a defining moment, a way of saying that the joy of God's people is not determined by their struggles, but by their future destiny. This theme appears later in Israel's story, when Israel suffered under the oppression of foreign empires. The prophet Isaiah looked for a day when God would raise up a new deliverer like Moses. That's when those redeemed by the Lord will return to Zion with glad shouts, with eternal joy crowning their heads. Happiness and joy will overtake them. And while the Israelites wait they chose joy to anticipate their future redemption. This is why it's significant that when Jesus of Nazareth was born, it was announced as good news that brings great joy. We're told that Jesus himself rejoiced and gave thanks to God his Father when he began to announce the kingdom of God. He even taught his followers the same joy in the wilderness, saying, when people reject you or persecute you for following me, rejoice, be very glad, because your reward is great in heaven. After his death and resurrection, Jesus commissioned his followers to go out and announce the good news that he was the risen king of the world. And as they did so, the early Christian communities were known for being full of joy, even when they were persecuted. Like when the Apostle Paul was sitting in a dirty Roman prison, he could say that he's chosen joy, even if he gets executed. He called this the joy of faith or joy in the Lord. He believed it was the gift of God's Spirit, a sign that Jesus' presence is with you, inspiring hope in the midst of hardship. And when you believe that Jesus' love has overcome death itself, joy becomes reasonable in the darkest of circumstances. Now, this doesn't mean that you ignore or suppress your sorrow. That's not healthy or necessary. Paul often expressed his grief about missing loved ones or losing friends or his own freedom. He called it being full of sorrow and yet rejoicing. As he acknowledged his pain, he also made a choice to trust Jesus, that his loss wouldn't be the final word. This is very different from the trite advice to turn that frown upside down. Christian joy is a profound decision of faith and hope in the power of Jesus' own life and love. And that's what biblical joy is all about. Now, in light of what we've just heard, I wonder... Where do we need to hear God's tidings of comfort and joy in our lives? I wonder what it might look like to discover the power of joy, even in the midst of struggle. As we ponder these things in our hearts, let us pray. God, our highest joy, we come to you this day as your servants, gathered to worship you and you alone. As we continue this Advent journey, help us to focus on you and the coming of your Son, Jesus. Even as we share the joy we find in you with one another, we are mindful of those for whom joy is hard to find. Those who don't have enough clothes, those who don't have enough food, those who don't have enough or any shelter, those who don't have enough protection and justice, those who feel lost, alone and afraid. We confess that there really is enough for everyone, but it's often down to us that the enough is hoarded by the few at the expense of the many. Help us to bear the good fruit that the Baptist called us to bear, being mindful of those around us who are going without during this season of giving. So we pray this day for those longing for spiritual renewal, we would ask that your Holy Spirit would invigorate us, that we may provide for others before expecting them to provide for us. So come into this place, come into this village of Oakley, encourage us to do the work to which we were baptized. Help us to proclaim the good news in word and deed. We pray this day for the hope that we have found, the peace we seek and the joy we will receive in your holy name. Amen. Well, have a great rest of your week, everyone. We look forward to seeing you at Church at Home this Sunday as we take up our final Advent theme of love. And as we prepare for our Blue Christmas services this weekend, we pray that God's comfort and His joy would be known by everyone in our community, in our church family, who is facing a difficult Christmas this year. God bless you all.